Welcome to the Mike Clegg YouTube channel and today we're about to start my uh, first live um, interview and podcast and I've got Quinton Fortune here, a very good friend of mine who uh, we used to play together down at Manchester United and we're going to have a really good discussion about all things football, history, the future and all the things in between. So Quinton, thank you very much for coming my friend, <laughs> thank you, it's an absolute pleasure. So I suppose we'll just set it up really with, you know, you, you played in the World Cup in 1998 and the year 2002. But you come from a very, very poor area mm. in South Africa, Cape Town, yep. called um, Q Town. Now, just tell us about what it was like, yep. um, early days, where you was born, and yep. the circumstances you was living in. Uh, early days were grandma taking care of me, my mum and dad were working, and uh, I was lucky enough, my, my grandma taught me everything. The first, I think the first few words I think she, I was told, she told me was please and thank you. So in our language, in Afrikaans, it's called a sublief and danke. And um, mum and dad were at work. My brothers uh, came to pick me up in nursery, whatever, when I was a kid. And they all played football. So I had four brothers, just uh, and, and my sister. And um, when they would play football, Mike, they took me everywhere. And I think that's why I picked up football, ever just watching them. And Q Town was an area like any, not many places in, in the Cape Flats where there's a lot of crime, uh, a lot of drugs. And um, thank God my parents, my grandmother put in good values uh, in me or planted good values. And I kind of avoided that. And um, from early days, I remember my dad made sure we went to church on a Sunday. And on Wednesday night, went to ch uh, um, Sunday school. And um, uh, my early days, I just remember running home from school with my brother's bags and I quite, didn't understand it quite then and I think when, he was, when I look back now I understood okay that was what was happening so uh, this was the 80s late 80s so things were changing in South Africa because in apartheid and my brothers were protesting the, um, the police or if you want to call it uh, the students were protesting against the police because they obviously wanted the apartheid to stop and um, there was tear gas and all that stuff so it was it was crazy but at the same time my environment I grew up in Mike it was crime and all that crazy stuff but next to my house was a football pitch and a stadium oh. so played football every single day it was Christmas for me on a Friday night I remember standing at the window or sitting at the window and I could see onto the football pitch so that was my life well that's an amazing sort of start and introduction <laughs> to yourself and I suppose one of the big lessons in there is the, the early lessons of knowing how to manage yourself and to mm. behave in a, in a public environment and I suppose me knowing you now they've mm. certainly lasted throughout your entire life. Mike it wouldn't be and I wouldn't take it any other way I think my my parents and my grandmother made sure that uh, we had respect for everyone if whatever happens to us in life that foundation that we treat people with respect uh, humility was the most important thing in a family <laughs> wherever we went uh, my, my parents always just remind me you greet everyone even the person laying on the floor there that's got nothing you say good morning and you're trying to help people and uh, um, I saw this from a very early age so I saw my grandmother how she she treated uh, everyone and um, yeah, if, if I stepped out of line I was uh, I was told very quickly. It's, it's quite interesting that, uh, what age did you actually leave? Um, I left uh, South Africa in 91, so I was 14 years old. Yeah. So even at 14 years old, you've obviously built up a big friendship of local friends, mm -hmm. and you can see that there's crime and there's maybe mm -hmm. drugs. How did you manage to navigate yourself through there? Football, Mike. Really? Uh, football. I was very fortunate, and I um, I saw that uh, on, on a regular basis, and, and it's like, uh, how do I describe it? It's just but because it's fear it, it it creates fear because you don't want to live in that kind of environment mm. and any any human being I think any part of the world want to live in peace and um, and there was a point where you don't I can I say make a decision to, to, to go down that route of, of crime but because you're young and you see it every day because we had a group of friends and we used to uh, at times have fights when you're a kid with the other groups yeah. of, of kids from another area and I remember, I don't know if this was a point in my life, um, and bless my sister, um, th we, there was one moment we were going to have a fight with all our groups of friends and my, from our area, kids from another area, and we met on the corner there, and we were just about to fight, and who was the one who could fight? And me. And then um, my sister came, and she broke up the fight, and she beat up the other guy. Oh. And it's like, but we were 13, 14, Mike, and, or 13, 12, whatever, 
and uh, it was like she kind of I felt I felt I looked bad in front of my friends because it's like here comes my sister helping me out and she was yeah. a little bit bigger. But thank God she did because it was just it's kids play, but that kids play can escalate into something crazy, especially in that environment. You can get a knife or mm. do this or that. And uh, I I have to say I had good people uh, around me. Like I said, my mom and dad, my brothers, my grandma, and my my friends, parents. They also made sure that. Um, you know, you stay away from that environment because we saw it on a regular basis. We used to stand there on the corner, Mike, and just watch people have gang fights and shoot. Well, and and you, so you, you actually seen people f shooting guns? Yeah, yeah. We were just Mike. It's like it becomes norm, and it's like it's not normal. When I used to, when I used to come home, it's like look back and think that's not normal. But for the kids growing up in that environment, yeah. that was normal. That was uh, every day on a, on a weekly basis. You see a group of guys chasing each other in that group and it's like really what is going on and that's when the opportunity came to leave my parents were like go okay so go before we get to there so you're yeah. in an environment there which is very stressful mm -hmm. um we're talking a little bit about like mental health with young children in this country and mm -hmm. you actually found a way around these issues by getting into sport and getting yeah. into football so who was the first football team you played for and yeah. then what was the development until the point where an opportunity come where you yeah. could actually leave South Africa and just talk us through that timeline well my, I played football like I said Mike every single day the first school I went to was a uh, Afrikaans school okay. so Afrikaans is uh, the Dutch old language that uh, we, we were colonized by the Dutch so the Afrikaans school meant you uh, uh, played rugby and for the environment I grew up in we didn't like rugby <laughs> we just it was almost like a, first of all the language you speak is a language that was forced upon us yeah then we wanted to play as a sport we didn't like mm. so it's just fine we at schools near to uh, where my, my mom grew up it's called Bukmakiri and my grandmother grew up in that area so I went there because all my brothers went there and we played school we played football beginning of before school first break second break after school and then the day I had to go and play rugby it's like oh no I don't want to do this played my first rugby game I tackled someone got hurt in my chin I came back I said my mum I can't do this and bless my mum she, she, she took me out to school same day Mike <laughs> put me to, to school in Q-Town well, she actually changed your school she changed my school wow just for that yeah and because uh, you know I, I love football so I played for my school team it was just great because they had uh, um, uh, it's called the Athlon District so we played for my school uh, team and uh, I played for everyone Mike you name them on a Sunday I ran away from church Sunday school nice to go and play football so whenever I, my parents were looking for me they knew Where'd you be? I was in a football pitch and just fell in love with the game Mike and uh, 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 I played for a team called Baltic Rangers and it was two guys they're Muslim guys it's called Samo and Fali and bless them because they came to pick us up every Saturday okay with the with their van and we always we used to wait in the corner and it was Mike this was like amazing times because that was the only outlet for us yeah football we were a group of guys kids from that area jump in a van and we used to drive to a place called um, Johnson's Road we got there and we had kit and because for us this was like special they're giving us kids they give us food what <laughs> this is like christmas and we just played and we had a, a a girl in our team she's probably our number 10 aisha right and uh that was every saturday and, and sometimes saturday when they couldn't come and get us we used to walk as a group uh, about three miles three four miles together and then um the, the first sorry forgive me if the first club i played for was in athens and that was that was probably about seven miles away so we always do all of us a group used to walk together up the road and it was a main road so it was safe and uh went to baltic ranges and then all this happened there mike it was it was brilliant because uh, like i said we were together as, as a group of friends and we played for the same team so quinton you're playing there with your friends you're yeah. playing with the girl up front and it's all very much fun it's getting you out and doing things yeah. get, just taking you away from being in the trouble spots but yeah. talk us now about how you've progressed to um, such a point where yeah. you know you leave it, um, south yeah. africa well I, I was very fortunate mike um, because i played everywhere and uh, it, it came to a point where i played so much football that i would sit on a football pitch at, at in the evenings and watch the, the older guys my brothers play and and I was the kid who would go and get the ball and eventually they just said join in so I think that's where I developed whatever skill or ability I had and um, uh, I think it was uh, I was 
nine years old where you get selected for the provincial team for your the best players in that area and uh, Western Province. And that's my first start of tra uh, traveling. So I traveled at, at the age of 10. We traveled to uh, Johannesburg and Durban, this place, and that was exciting. It was mm. like, oh my goodness, this is, this is happening. And then from there, I just kept going and I just kept making progress and until um, we got selected for the Western Province team again under 14s. And this was a strange one, Mike, because they call it the first multiracial team. Oh, okay. Because in South Africa at that time, uh, we didn't play against white players and never had a white coach, so you never en encounter with white people, right. which is very confusing looking back now. But that was the country we lived in. Mm -hmm. So uh, the guy who was our manager was named Colin Gee. He was the first white person I think I ever had, had contact with at 13. And then we mix black, white, Indian, you name a Muslim, everyone just amazing uh, team they selected. And that was the first Western Province multiracial team, we were told. And it was great because as kids we were like got on so well mike and mm. for some reason we didn't we didn't could we didn't say why didn't we do this a long time before but because we, we didn't know about it we knew what was going on but we were we were just so focused you live in your area you live your life you got food on the table and that was life but when they put us together it was absolutely brilliant it's like why have they kept us away from each other but and that uh, happened we went to play the national tournament so that's all the best provincials in, the, in South Africa and uh, we were lucky enough to, to win the tournament. Wow. Um, after the tournament, uh, a gentleman named Colin Gee was our manager. He said to me, would I like to go to uh, England? I was like, yeah, let's go. I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, but so so how, how did that feel then? So well, the feeling of maybe leaving home, or yeah. was it the feeling like I've got a chance of becoming a professional player or was it I'll just go for an adventure? That's a good question. Um, never thought about becoming a professional football player, Mike. Mm. Just wanted to play football. Mm. And um, when Colin said, uh, you know, would you like to go to England? I'm like, yeah. Because we got the few images, at the, I think we had a TV by then, of English football. And my friends at school used to speak about Manchester United. And I didn't take much note of it because I just want to play football. But the crazy thing is when, I, when Colin asked me that question, Mike, I used to sit on. A, there's a. They've taken a football pitch away now, next to the next to our flats where we used to where I grew up, and I used to sit there on the pitch and wonder or look up in the sky. I swear to God, this is honest truth, and look up in the sky to the clouds and go. In my mind, I used to think, what was life like in the UK? Don't know where it came from. Don't know how I had this imagination, and I always used to sit there and think, like, what was life like? And and it's just strange as a kid, just sit there on my own and. Imagine, wow, life would like be. A few months later, I'm playing this tournament. Collins asked me, "Let's go to the UK." I'm like, okay, wh whatever happened there just happened, and uh, obviously, I had to come and see my parents. So he mm. came to see my mum and dad um, because he needs um, permission for my parents. I'm a minor, so my parents said, uh, "I said, yeah," oh. and I think my parents were just happy that one of us can as an opportunity, Mike. At the same time, is one of us are out of the environment, mm. and my mum was, my mum and dad were happy because they know I love football. It was ridiculous, Mike. And mornings I wake up, I used to leave so early as to steal my brother's boots, so they would go absolutely mental. I come home seven o'clock in the evening, so they know I was crazy for football. And um, when my parents said yes, um, I moved. They took me out of school, and I stayed with Colin for six months. Okay. So for that six months, he trained me. Um, so this is still in South Africa. This is still in South Africa before I came to the UK. Yeah. So for six months, I trained f three or four months. I trained four, three, four times, three, ta three times a day, Mike. So this is like a personal training camp. This is a personal him just training me, and um, I mean, I have a lot of thanks to give to him mm. um, because he prepared me probably for the rest of my life. Uh, six o'clock in the morning. Uh, 12 or 1 o'clock in the afternoon and 5 in the evening and it was running it was gym it was football and you name it because it was probably the hardest training I've ever done in my life to prepare me for whatever was to come so you've got put the preparation in you're yeah. obviously a skillful player in an environment which is quite high level mm -hmm. Colin's obviously seen real talent and now he's putting this training plan now you're about to go to England so just Tell us, you know, imagine being on that plane and it's such a long journey, mm -hmm. and you know, you, you turn up. Where, where do you even arrive? And uh, yeah. what, what was your promise, or what was you expecting, yeah. and what was it like? 
my god i didn't know what to expect the first time i've ne never been in a plane first of all i was trying to open the windows wow. and um <laughs> i was doing all sorts in the plane and uh just i had no understanding what i was getting into i just remember arriving in london at Heathrow airport the first accent the london accent uh, i heard the cockney accent the driver just like wow and i remember the place the first area we stayed in was called bell's eyes park okay. and colin and his wife glenda they came over with me and uh took me to uh um the old tottenham training ground mill hill training ground yeah and it's just it's just a lot mike because you see terra Venables, you see gaza you see Garlinica is like so right away then you're in the environment in the actual training ground the first team players are knocking around and yeah. the manager and you're there and it's just like and a big shot it's you have to like boom 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 and it's just there's no preparation for it it's just i think for me i look back and now it's like an adventure as a kid yeah i wasn't i wasn't ready for any of that so it's like the greatest adventure in the world isn't it yeah and normally kids might go into the you know the um, uh, pleasure beach or yeah. they might go to the you know the, the zoo you're going to england playing yeah. football with the greats it's just it's madness mike and and, and like I said, there's no preparation for it because I was just excited. I was like, okay, I'm getting on a plane. That was first excitement. I'm going to another country, which I always had in, in my mind. I imagined w what it would be like. Then I'm going to Tottenham. Here's Terry Venables. <sighs> and then uh, this Gaza. <laughs> like, <laughs> what? Gaza's driving around every morning at the training ground, uh, cutting the kid, this kid up, uh, uh. driving around in the, bu and, uh, the, 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 the milk buggy, whatever you call it, yeah. and just making jokes every day and taking the piss out of people so so, was so when you was there then what was the actual uh, was you um, on trial was you on uh, yeah i was on, i was on trial yeah. so um they put me into the youth team and i trained with the youth team for uh two or three weeks and um so now you, as i said to you my i was probably ahead of my my age group because i've done just ridiculous training mm. um i ran up mountains i ran up you name them i've picked the whole gym up <laughs> so i was ripped as a 14 year old kid they were looking at me like nah people this is the first thing they thought you're not 14. they like check the passport, check the passport. <laughs> so i had all that i had all that stuff about yeah. come on you know really tell us the truth and i'm like no i'm 14 and because i was qu the same size yeah. i was very skinny but obviously when, when colin trained me, i was like yeah based and because uh, i had to I, I couldn't just come uh, to the uk and, and be as the other kids i had to be ahead Something of them different of course. exactly yeah. and um so th what blew my mind, Mike, I trained with, the, with, the, with the, my age group under 14, 16, 17, whatever they threw me into. And then Terry Venables called me over wow. uh, one day. Uh, I said, no, you're training with the first team. <laughs> Mike, can you nice. just imagine my, your heart, like, just <laughs> drops like, <laughs> what? <laughs> so I trained with the first team, and I just remember they were absolutely brilliant. It was like, uh, Naeem was there, uh, uh, Vinny Samways. Uh, Mickey Hazard, uh, Paul Stewart, Garnica, and all these guys in Gaza, and it was just uh, amazing. And Terry Venables, bless him, he was he was unbelievable with me. Like he just said to me, "Just go enjoy it. Put his arm around me and just do what you've been doing there with the with the younger players, and just go and enjoy." So I trained with the first team. It was like. As a 14 year old Mike it's just not it's not possible so did they actually sign you then how, how did that work did, we, did you sign like a two-year um... I signed a four-year contract okay so they put me into uh, digs yeah uh, stayed in Enfield um, I had an amazing landlady Carol and um, to stay in the country uh, I had to go to school which I accept but I didn't know I had to go to um, a school that that goes to they had to go to school on a Saturday as well but I wanted to play for Tottenham on a Saturday okay so that kind of frustrated me, but that was the agreement with the school because the school said, look, if we're going to help you guys out, he's going to play for the school team. I'm like, oh, no, oh, no. Yeah. no. Which is great. I mean, the play for the school team, uh, uh, it was a private school. It's called Epping Forest. And uh, I played for Tottenham sometimes, well, for my, my youth team on a Sunday. And we used to have regular games against, uh, once or twice a year against Lily Shaw, because that time Lily Shaw was where the best kids yeah, grew. that's right. And that was great because you played against the best young English players in the mm -hmm. country, and uh, to test yourself against them, and that was absolutely brilliant. And um, and that's how it all started, Mike. But ultimately, then, when you was at Tottenham, you actually had to leave England, didn't you? Yeah. And you you ended up going to Spain. Mm -hmm. Is that because of some type of visa issue? No, it was visa issue, and 
that's when all the money started to kick in, Mike, about agents and all that stuff. And okay. So the the contract was on the table for me to sign. Right. Um, my agent didn't want to sign the contract. Okay. And Colin, because of what Colin done for me, I just listened to every word he said. Of course, yeah. And yeah. Uh, it was kind of tough because we, we went back home to South Africa. Did you really? So I left. Before I went back home, uh, we left Tottenham. It was heartbreaking because we were doing well in the Youth Cup, so mm -hmm. we would probably have met or played against each other in the Youth Cup. And, and I just left that year and I was like heartbroken because... So we beat Tottenham in the final that year? That was my team. So you would have played... So that, Neil Fenn... That's right, yeah. That was my team. Stephen Clements. Stephen Clements, yep. yeah. That was my team. We would have been playing against each other right back left Exactly. Wing. So... <laughs> You would, have, my, you would have finished you would have my, in my pocket. No, you, exactly, you, would have, you would have finished my career. I would have had to say, can I change that? But that was my team. Wow. So I just left a few weeks before that, Mike. That's incredible. So incredible. I, uh, And I went to Chelsea. So yeah, it, Chelsea, it took yeah. me to Chelsea, and uh, um, Chelsea also tried to keep me in the country, but Tottenham done all the work to keep me in the country okay. in terms of work permit. So it was just messy. And I mean, I spent great eight, nine months with Chelsea, and uh, they had Glenn Hoddle there, which was unbelievable amazing coach and uh, manager as well and they had the the youth team or the reserve one of 21s graham ricks and he was yeah. unbelievable brilliant and uh, i wanted to stay at chelsea but i couldn't stay in the country so we went home so i'm thinking it's over well of course you're gonna think that i'm thinking what well, all that work and I didn't know what to do, mate. i didn't know what to think and i'm so what did colin say though and how long did you end up being in south africa for for a year doing nothing for a year not playing for anyone Wow. Just training. I didn't know that. Just training, Mike, with Colin, and I didn't know where my life was going. So I'm back to where I didn't want to be. I st obviously stayed with Colin in his house in a nice area, but okay. I still back, still went back to uh, Q Town, and and that was kind of a, an interesting period in my life as well because y you go back there and people look at you a little bit different. Obviously, mm. I could I look at Q Town now, and I went, uh, from living over here and how small the place look and mm. people's mentality and you just don't know Mike people might look at you different thing ah oh, this guy he thinks he's yeah of course so I was lucky to survive that year and uh, somehow Colin organized um, uh, a trial at Atletico Madrid and off we went to Spain so, so next minute on the flight again on to Spain on the flight again to Spain with not much football practice really but you just had a lot training. of general conditions yeah, but no games no games just training with uh, Colin was the manager of a team called uh, Hellenic and they had probably the in that time the best group of young players in the country okay. they won everything so I was training with that training is good you know Mike but you need to play games of course and I just kept training and kept fit and so you get over to Atletico then Atletico Madrid so did you speak Spanish? No, nothing <laughs> Spanish. Nice. So into the deep end, Mike, uh, they put me into an apartment because now I'm 17, 18 years old, mm. 18 years old, and I'm just staying with Spanish players and a few other foreign lads, and it's just Spanish. TV's in Spanish, the lads don't speak English, and it's just boom, day one. Fortuna. This and boom, 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 Buenos Dias learning. It's like, what? But of course, the, the language you all spoke was football, yeah, yeah. and that was the best, Mike. In, I think in Spain, you develop, because everything is about football. So the first thing they did was having a box. I'm like, oh, this is Christmas. Great, get in the box and uh, um, everything goes well. Two, three weeks trial and they said, brilliant, everything good. Five years contract. Wow, I'm five like, years. Wow. So you like, must have really impressed on that trial, Mike. I don't friend. know what I did, Mike. I was just, I had the best time for that two, three weeks just playing with everyone they put me in the first team they put me on the 21s with the kids we played uh, times on gravel which I thought this is like home yeah, yeah. so obviously they didn't know this, this, is, the best this, this, is, this is what we play like my home this is like uh, Wembley for me and uh, oh, it was just great because they want to play football Mike they just everything is to do with the ball and did you end up getting the first team there yep uh, so for that sign for uh, uh, Atletico Madrid I made my debut um, it was against of all the teams, Barcelona. Wow, so, so you're making your first in debut first Barcelona. First debut, thanks coach. Um, so Barcelona at this time. Uh, average team. Yeah, that Pep, Pep was playing, yeah. he was okay. But they had another average player called Ronaldo from Brazil. <laughs> and he was okay, nice. he was okay. He wasn't, I don't think he's done any, he needed to do some leg weights, Mike. Yeah. He wasn't bad, bad, he bad, bad. He was an absolute, I say to people now, Mike, I love Messi. And yeah. I think Cristiano Ronaldo is absolute beast. 
uh, Neymar, Ronaldinho, but this guy was <coughs> all those players put together because he had everything, Mike. Without doubt, Ronaldo is he, up there as the best player had, in the world ever. The power in the legs was just, it was ridiculous because you get, you, you, Mike, you know yourself, uh, you get players over the years that are quick, but they don't have the intelligence of mm. when to run. He had the intelligence, then he could slow down if he wanted to beat you. Um, so the co coach calls me and uh, my debut, second half, game was starting the second half, he scored a hat-trick already the first half, <laughs> and I'm just about to go on and the coach goes, Fortuna, yeah, yeah, coach, um, I want you to mark Ronaldo. Oh, all the best. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, finest coach, yeah. Of all the players you could have picked, you picked Ronaldo. But it was great for me because, Mike, because I got to kind of see where... Your level was. My level, and he ah. was just... I remember trying to tackle him in the game and got nowhere near him and I remember just getting up and I don't know if there's clips of it and I'm clapping and I'm like, no, he can't clap you in the game. <laughs> but he was that amazing, Mike, and that was my first taste of my, my, my professional debut because yeah. I didn't do my make my professional debut at Tottenham. So I suppose that is like a real baptism of fire. You, oh. you're, in, you're in the cauldron there, you're seeing it at a very high level, you're yeah. seeing where potentially, you know, how good footballers yeah. can be. So within that environment at Atletico, how long did you stay within the first team squad? Did you, did you score many goals? Did you really feel like you made yeah. an impact? No, because I made my debut and then boom, straight off, they sent me on loan to a place, a uh, club called Mallorca. Okay. So they were in the... Uh, Segunda A in the well in the second you know, championship or you want to call it the year, yeah. which was a little shock for me because Mallorca is a beautiful place, Mike. Oh. So I'm staying in a place called Paseo Maritimo outside my apartment. There's a massive boat. I'm thinking, whoa, what is this? Um, probably the lowest point in my whole football career at at at, um, at uh, Mallorca. Really? Um, the manager there, because obviously my Spanish wasn't that good, so the manager didn't speak to me. Oh, okay. And then uh, it got to a point where he just told me to go sit on the sideline, and I'm like, "What am I doing? Like, what's going on here?" And and it's the first time in my life I experienced racial abuse from one of my teammates. Wow! And it's a senior player, so I'm like, "What your own teammate?" My own teammate, and this was a senior player, so I was like, already down that I'm not playing, mm. and no explanation. And then I get this from uh, a senior player, and I was like. And I remember just uh, going back to my apartment, I was crying, I was like praying, like, like how, how like, how am I getting, what's going on in my life? How did I get to this point? So you, you got a down moment here, yeah. but I suppose maybe dealing with this and the rest yeah. of the story, you probably created a certain amount of resilience. I don't and know, know what I created, Mike, yeah. From South Africa, yeah. the training counts with Colin, yeah. the disappointment maybe from Tottenham, yeah. and suddenly you're playing first team football, you're excited, you go on loan, but now you're getting racial abuse, you can't speak the language, yeah. you're in a difficult position, but something there... Yeah has got to give you some grit so I think it was more of uh, not wanting to go back home Mike mm. and I didn't never I was kind of a thing about back in my head and, and fear of going back to that environment and and that kind of kept me going because all I kept saying myself no because I had nightmares about gang fights and shooting and stabbing and all this drug stuff and I think that kept me like that fear kept me no 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 we don't want to go back you don't want to go back so get through this um, trying to avoid that negativity as much as possible. After six months, I went back to Atletico Madrid, played in the B team for a few seasons, made a few first team appearance because our manager from the B team became the first team manager. Okay. Um, and he took all of us and we had a good group of players. We ended up, I think, winning our league that the last year we, before we all left and, uh, and I started making a few first team appearances. It was great because I'm thinking, okay, this is the next level and that's where I wanted to be. Um, and after that, we, uh, uh, by this time, I, after a few years, I could speak Spanish and I picked up the language and it was great. And, but Atletico Madrid was unstable at that time because uh, they were just changing managers after manager every year. So yeah. one manager will come in who like you, next manager comes and doesn't like you. So I just, I think we all were at the point where we just wanted to leave. Okay, so through this sort of sketchy time and yeah. uncertain time, how do you therefore get from not really being a really settled first team Atletico yeah. player to suddenly getting to Man United? That's, I can only think that's down to Colin. Okay. Uh, Colin must have known someone at, at, at United yeah. and um, he organised for me to come in the trial at United. So what was that like when you had that like opportunity? Oh, it's crazy, yeah. Mike, because I'm sitting in Madrid, uh, 99, I'm watching 
United on TV can play against uh, <laughs> Bayern Munich. Yeah. And I'm watching every column, we're like, this is unbelievable. <laughs> Last two minutes in this going on, we're celebrating for no reason. We don't even know why we celebrated, but it was brilliant. Mm. And um, now then you get on trial. And then I'm going to the cliff. Next moment, I'm at the cliff. And who was the first person you saw when you arrived there? Was you welcomed in by you know, like, uh, the Alex uh, Ferguson? What is the, what is the, the, the chief scout? Uh, was, was the old chief scout? Mick Brown? Mick Brown, yeah. yeah. He came to pick me up at the airport. Did he really? And Mick was brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Oh my goodness. Mick made you feel like so calm. Because I'm, I'm sitting in, a, in, a, in, a in the car and Mick is speaking. And I'm like all sorts of getting through my mind driving on the way to Cliff. And <sighs> I'm just watching these guys on TV. I'm, Beckham and Skinny and Giggsy and oh my god, what is going on? So I arrive at the cliff and I'm like, is this the training ground? Is this Manchester United training ground? I'm, I probably expected it's some, some unbelievable, but it was absolutely brilliant. The pitch was amazing. Uh, the changes were very small and it's like, wow. Yeah, because obviously at the cliff, which is in Salford and Broughton, yeah. as, as I'm sure many of the, the, the viewers know and the watchers, is it's a small little it was pitch. We had a little, uh, we had a Wembley section. The Wembley set, yeah. We had the, the pitch down below with an old-fashioned um, stand there. Ultimately, the actual changing rooms and uh, where the manager's office and the canteen overlooked yeah. the actual pitch, and yeah. then there was an inside section. But it certainly wasn't anything like what Carrington is now, yeah. which is like a mega complex it's with all the, the. But I'm so happy, Mike. I got to experience that. Yeah. He got to. Because the history. The history. That yeah. was where the likes of Sir Bobby, uh, uh, George Best, and mm. Dennis Law, all these great players played. And it's like, I'm here now. And remember the first time I met the boss? Oh, my goodness. It was just try your best to understand what he was trying to say because he's obviously strong oh, Scottish course, accent. Yeah, yeah. And all I just remember saying yes. Yes, but just agree, don't say anything. So, how long was you there on trial then? Uh, two weeks. Two weeks. And, and then and what the, did they say then? The boss came to me saying, that, you know, well done and don't give you much, just well done and yeah. we're we'll assigning you. Very good. And then. Uh, um, and obviously, that's probably when we first met. And yeah. It was, yeah. Uh, it was just brilliant because I trained obviously with the first team and trained with the uh, uh, reserve team in that time and uh, I think Mick was our manager or, or Ch I think Chucky came after us but Mick was our uh, Mick Phelan, uh, Mick yeah. Phelan yeah. and there was the Jono and, 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 and Willow and all these guys and it was brilliant and uh, I just remember Steve, Steve McLaren was there and Jim Ryan and mm -hmm. it was absolutely brilliant because, <coughs> because it, you see all these players that I had on my wall as a kid when I was at Tottenham mm -hmm. so we used to clean the changing rooms at Tottenham after a game, and I remember one season when United came and Cantona was still playing, and we cleaned the change room. And I used to, I always walk around with a tennis ball, and we used to play football and tennis in, in in the change room. And it's the, probably the most amazing experience I've had in my life, Mike. We were playing, and Cantona was the only player stopped and had a kick about with us in the change room. Did you really? Yeah. Absolutely, like we were like. This is the best moment. We all know Eric is the king, and I speak oh, a lot about Eric and goodness. how he, he actually changed the mindset down at Man United yep. with, with the extra training he did yep. after, after training. You know, it used to be a case of the lads used to train, and once he was finished, he'd just go in and get changed. But when Eric turned up, he did this extra bit of training, yep. school training. I remember him just pinging the balls into the bag, yep. and all he used to do these keep you ups. Everybody was like, oh my god, who is this guy? Yep. And I think that's set on the next sort of uh, round of being professional. I remember. Gaz Neville and Phil Neville clipping balls to each other, yeah. Beckham taking his free kicks. We used to set stay out doing passing. Yeah. Eric Cantona has a lot of um, you know real good things at Man United. Yeah. No, he was amazing. So tell to us about your debut at Man United. I can't remember it myself, but I'm sure it's a massive moment for you. Well, Mike, they threw me, the boss threw me in. Uh, he was against Newcastle. I came on last few minutes. It was just like, I don't think I was physically ready for. Uh, from a came from a you know, the Spanish football very slow, tranquilo and. Never hardly did any weights in Spain. It was all football. Yeah. And I remember coming on Newcastle. It was like poof, poof, speed and intensity, and um, it was great because I, I think the football part is, is great. But the, the, I think the the physical side I need to get better. Mm. And uh, I think I played 15 minutes near the end. But then the boss uh, uh, still trained with the first team, but I played more of reserve team games, kind of to to get me ready. And uh, I flew my parents over in December because just the first time because my parents never been out of. South Africa or Cape Town and uh, I just wanted to be, be uh, first Christmas I think my parents would spend with me in Europe or since I left South Africa in 91 and uh, mum and dad was over and I don't know if the boss knew that but I just knew I wanted to be with my parents 
I came over and um, it was against Bradford. It was a cold December, Mike, and the pitch. <laughs> you know what the pitch was like then. Yeah. Honestly, the lads now, they're unbelievable. Any, any weather, the pitch is... The bowling green, yeah. Unbelievable. And I remember the pitch was muddy and, and, and Mike, I didn't expect it to make my debut. The mm. boss just went, you're playing. Two feelings, Mike. Excitement and oh my goodness. No preparation for it. Just the hour before the game, you're playing. Because yeah. I've been going in every game, sitting there and wishing that, that you know, for that moment to happen. Yeah. But when the boss says to you that you're playing, <laughs> all sorts, your stomach drops. Your heart. And the realisation, same with me, it's like the most fear you can imagine, yeah. but also intense like excitement. Yeah. And it's almost like your heart just goes and then you just got to deal with the situation. And how did the game go? Mike, it was a, uh, it was, it was a, well, some of the best of games because we tried to play as, as, as much as good football on that pitch. But I have to give Yap and, and the lads uh, a thanks for, for, for the way they, they made me feel part of the team yeah. and uh, you can imagine Mike there was a muddy and you're just trying to do as best you can I'm running and I'm this is my moment Mike I've been imagining this moment for so long and I'm in it now and I'm Keeney's over there and Teddy's up front and Colin uh, I don't know if Teddy was playing that game but he was just yap at the back it was like so many things going through your mind uh, I'm trying my best to do beat my man and do everything right and uh uh, yep, bless him. We got a free kick the first half on edge of the box, and Yap runs over Quinny. You taking it? Nice. Mike is like, really? Yap of all the players on the pitch, you <laughs> put the ball down, hit the free kick over the wall, hit the crossbar. Oh, crowd are going, Phew. and that kind of it loves you because mm. first of all, Yap says to you, Quinny, you taking it? And I'm thinking, really, Yap? You could have asked Keeney or anyone, but no, you're taking it. Get the freaky over the wall. Lifts you. The crowd is like, wow, okay. And then the second half starts. I think it was 0-0. First half, it was tight because the pitch wasn't in the best condition. Um, I don't know if it was the first goal. I think it was the first goal. Ole crossed it. Yeah, Ole crossed it? Yeah, Ole crossed it. And Coley, I, I don't know how I made this run, Mike. I ran in front of Coley. Yeah. Slid, got it, and touched it in. And... It looked, people thought Coley scored, but I, I remember I touched the ball and I ran that way, Coley ran that way. And I remember just so much excitement because it's like... And it was your goal? It was my goal. Yeah, that my, you my know? My yeah. my it's like, come on, this is the best moment ever. My mum and dad is here wow. and it's just like, come on, what is this? This is just the ultimate. So I mean, yeah. so hopefully children will watch this as well and you know, you're looking at how dreams can come true. You're talking yeah. about, you know, sitting on that pitch, looking at the stars, and having that imagination, and thinking about maybe playing in England. And mm -hmm. you know, f so many years later, it actually comes true. You know, it's, it's yeah. an amazing story. And, and I suppose after that, now you want to become a regular in the first team, and yeah. you've got to go back down to earth. You've got to get back to the training ground yeah. and, and, and get getting with the lads every day training. So, yeah. obviously, what year was this when you made your debut? This was uh, 2000, 99, 2000, yeah. So spanning that either side then through your United career, you obviously, I don't know if you can see it behind your head, but you obviously went to the World Cup. Yeah. So how was that as an experience? World Cup was, Mike, United was was, um, was out of this world experience. And because uh, the World Cup I played when I was still in Madrid. Yeah. 98, so um, the World Cup is a strange one, Mike, because my first World Cup I understood or, re or first watched was 1990 in mm. Italy. Mm. And uh, we remember watching the opening game against Cameroon and Argentina and sitting there and watching like, wow, Cameroon. I think they, they, they won the first game, That's opening right. game against Argentina. I headed from a uh, play called Makanaki and we were all celebrating. It was like, it's an African team. <laughs> like, awesome. wow, this is possible. Eight years later, I'm, sitting, I'm, I'm in the World Cup, Mike. Incredible. It's like, come on, we're like, and I just remember uh, standing in the tunnel, looking over Sidan. Who did you play? Opening game was against France. Oh. Sidan, Thierry Henry, Dugarry, Desai, Laurent Blanc. Makalele. Like, so that's another baptism in the fire for you? It's like, Mike, because it's just like, oh, come on. When I arrived at uh, Tottenham, uh, former well, teammate then uh, Neil Fenn because he knew I loved Pele so he gave me a book about Pele and all the stuff I read in, at 
Pelé about how he won the World Cup with, with Brazil, how he grew up in 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 uh, in, 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 in uh, São Paulo and in, in, in Rio and not in Rio in Brazil, and where he came from, poverty and end up scoring and, and uh, the World Cup in '17. And, and I, I wanted to be like Pelé, so I started imagining all these things and how he played in the World Cup. And and here I'm standing in the tunnel, eight years later from watching the World Cup uh, at home as a kid. And we played the opening against against France. It was just like incredible. Come on, this is this is just beyond anything I could ever have imagined, Mike. What so score was that game? We lost three 0 Yeah. Um, it was a disappointing loss, but just a just a experience, Mike. We had the World Cup. Incredible. incredible. We had the World Cup. It's so just, with the uh, two World Cups, did you did you win any games in the two World Cups? We uh, we lost the first game against uh, France. We drew against Denmark and Saudi so we drew 1-1 against Denmark Saudi Arabia uh, we drew 3-3 wow. Denmark only had two okay players Laudrup and Michael Laudrup and Brian Laudrup so they were okay <laughs> so these were like Mike you must understand for me it was like just beyond because I had all these players are honestly as a kid at, at Tottenham in my room on my wall uh, well it sounds to me when I was a kid and used to collect like panini stickers and, like my little lad now collects what's called match attacks yeah and you're looking at these aren't you you're thinking wow you're looking at the stats and you just think this is incredible yeah. even if you get the, like, the right card like, yes I got that's right <laughs> <laughs> you're playing against these guys yeah. it's like it's like one moment you, you, you're playing against all these players yeah, on the playstation yeah, yeah. and a few years later you are with them on the pitch it was. It was. It was uh, I mean, that's amazing. Amazing. So, two thousand two. Did you did you win a game in, in that 2002 one? Two thousand two, we played opening game against uh, Paraguay. So uh, we're losing two one. Last minute, um, we get a penalty, Mike. So I went to go and get the ball. Good. Not thinking I'm going to take it. I'm looking. <laughs> so, no, honest, honest, just Mike. I'm turning around. What's There's no one. Else? There's no one. <laughs> <laughs> so the lads are obviously going. Oh, well done, Queenie, <laughs> brave. <laughs> no, but honest truth is, Mike. A uh, couple of months before that, we played in the African Nations Cup, and I missed a penalty against um, against Ghana. Right. And I got, I'm sure I got a lot of stick back home from the media. And I kind of wanted to put that right. Take, put that right. Yeah. And um, I remember taking a penalty and uh, put the ball down. This is a lo last moment. And you can see that you can see the clip when you uh, go on Google the penalty. One of the players from Paraguay came up to me and he, he spoke to me in Spanish. Oh, nice. And it's just like you know you're gonna miss. Oh. And, I, and when you look at my face, Mike. It's crazy because I laugh at him. I'm like, why are you, like, por qué? Why are you saying that? And I'm like, and I'm like, how am I so calm? But I just remember laughing and like, put the ball down. Because uh, the few previous months against Ghana, I, I, for some reason I placed it on the, on the left hand, from left left hand yeah, to the right hand corner. Yeah. And I never do that. And I just knew myself, just do what you regularly do, whatever you did as a kid. I just put my foot through it and yeah. whip it in the top corner. And I just remember putting the ball down, calm myself, and I just whipped it in the top corner, Mike. And nice. I wouldn't say it's a top corner, but just it went in. Uh, and I remember running. And that's uh, over like five moments. <laughs> scoring in the World Cup, my friend. But this is what this is what all the things that I imagined yeah. as a kid and dreaming about it after reading the Pelé book and watching uh, Italy in 1990. Uh, imagine all yeah. these players. We'll, and ta we'll talk a lot about that near the end, just because I got a few questions near the end, which is going to touch on that side of things. Mm -hmm. And again, th we all know that imagination. If you can think it, it can be true. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to United times now, then um, you're there for how many years? Was you there? I was there six years. Six, six years. years. Six, yeah, six years. So I mean. you scored plenty of goals. You're mm -hmm. playing lots of games. You're getting the feel for that. And you, 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 that was probably the mainstay of your actual career at Man United. That was the best moments of my football career, Mike, at yeah. United, yeah. And within that environment, who were the people you really learned from? Who were the people you admired? And um, I remember what, reading an article one day, and it was um, Dwight York, and mm. he answered a question. We used to always do these quizzes and stuff, but we had to do them for, like, say, match or for these 4 4 2. But um, Dwight York, who's an incredibly skillful yeah. player, said that the question was, who is the most skillful player you mm. ever trained with, played with? And he mm. put Quinton Fortune. Well, I must give Yoki's money back then. <laughs> oh, my now, Yoki was, like I said, Yoki's probably one of those players I admired because he was just so unbelievable calm. Mm. I remember the difference between him and, and Keeney and walking the change room and how Keeney was. And obviously, you know, oh, Keeney, like, <laughs> Keeney was just, <laughs> the first couple of years, it took me a while to get to understand uh, Keeney's nature, but later on, he was absolutely brilliant. But 
Yoki was so calm and, and relaxed and the difference between him and watching Kane and Yoki is like, I need to pick up a little bit from everyone. Yeah, the quotes as well. And man. the way uh, the likes of Gaz and Nevin Phil train and Giggsy was so amazing and, and the skulls and and the work body and the work ethic, that was that what blew me away, Mike. Oh. How everyone worked. You got the best so called players in the Premier League and probably in Europe, but they worked the hardest. Which was like what is going on here? And that inspired me because I wanted to be like Keeney, I wanted to be like Yorkie. The way Ole was off the training, practicing free kick, not free kicks, uh, finishing. Um, the way the, the gas never behave and, and feel professional on time, always doing the right things. And so you had all these examples around you, like with Scolzi. Scolzi oh. would be amazing in games and training and just go home quietly. Yeah, there's a, there's a really good mixture of different personalities, wasn't there? And I think that's what makes a brilliant, brilliant mm -hmm. team. I was lucky, <coughs> not play as many games as you, but I was certainly around it for them times, and nobody was the same as somebody else. Yep. And I think that sort of mixture of um, different variety created yep. something which was so, so special. Yep. And ultimately led by, by the boss, Alex the boss, Ferguson, yeah. who, who obviously I always remember, this is, a <coughs> this is funny, but they used to always say to Quinton, um, uh, we used to be in the boxes and say if you Quinton give it away they'll say Costa Costa <laughs> and I was thinking what are you having a coffee what are you he cost a fortune <laughs> I know I, used to, I always wanted to say something back to the like to the boss something funny or yeah. getting back never never thought about it just took it and go okay boss you're the boss so if he used to always get me over that and I thought I need to find some word to say, you know, yeah. get him back, but no, never. But that was a great environment in there, yeah. and ultimately, um, within that period of time, I know you got asked to do lots of things for charity, and yep. UNICEF, yep. and all these type of things which you carried on till now. But we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute, but leaving Man United. Yeah, the worst mean, moment. Yeah. Never want to leave, I think, uh, um, the injuries I had, and uh, that didn't help. But um, look, Mike, it's just, uh, first of all, I, th I think, I picked up injuries because of some of the tackles I went in and I think look back now I was like that was not me but I just remember I was a it was Sunday in the way in the, some cup game and I remember um, there was a 50-50 and I didn't go in I jumped oh. and I it was like I didn't think of anything because well, I came from Spain it's like that's how we, this is just normal in Spain mm -hmm. I remember the boss had a quiet word to me or the, whatever they call the hair dryer treatment and he told me basically look if you ever want to play for this club again you don't jump out the 50-50 tackles. I was like, okay, I want to play for this club. So whatever 50-50 came after that, Mike, you I went in. Yeah. And uh, some I should have not probably gone into. And um, So what was your main injuries? What what did you pick up over the Just knee, knee injuries. And yeah. some I could have probably avoided. Some, there was 50-50s where I thought, I'm never going to get it, but I can't pull out here, so I have mm. to go for it. And uh, I know myself, look, it's not me, and, and I just wanted to kind of show my my braveness whatever you want to call it and uh, if this if that's going to help me get into the team mm. I'll do it if I have to play left back I don't care midfield I don't care I just want to play my because yeah. you know what it's like to play for United is the best moment and we know them injuries are debilitating you know he can be yeah. out for six nine months and oh. Rory Keane had his injuries Ben yeah. Tony back in the day yourself and yeah. you know myself moving from my playing careers into being a strength and conditioning coach yeah. you know how hard it is for the lads who do get injured for a long time oh, it's a because you're in the gym day in day out yeah. day in day out you're not playing football you're not a part of the actual yeah. um, change of him spirit and you go, you go and play in the games and getting that real good feedback and yeah. um, must have been tough times for you. That was low times, Mike, because first of all, it's, it's hard enough trying to get into the team mm. when you're fit. Mm. Now you're not even, you have to watch from the from the gym and it's like, it's a nightmare because you can see the lads go out and training. And that's all we wanted to do. We just wanted to play football mm -hmm. and just have a touch and just run around the simple things. And, and I don't care what anyone says, there's no money in the world that gives you the feeling of playing for Manchester United, of training with the lads, going out there at El Old Trafford and there's nothing that feeling is the best and that's all I wanted just go and play football and you sit in the gym and and you just putting your head down and work and trying to remain positive and I think I started reading books and, and, and I think my faith by going to church that kept me going and, and that fear of I can't stop I have to keep going I, I don't want to go back and that kind of pushed me kept me going and I did everything I could train hard, train hard, train because I always knew that's what I did at the beginning at 14 yeah. 
to get to where I want to be back with the first team again, I, I have to work hard and I always have to in my mind. Hard work pays off. Yeah, and obviously that's that's good habits. That that's good understanding from your mm -hmm. upbringing and knowing what you had to do. And there's probably many players out there, and I've worked with many myself, who have gone through these injuries. But yeah. guys, just stick with it. Train hard. Have a positive thought moving yeah. forward. Work with your strength and conditioning coaches and sports scientists, like what what I was and what my father does now. And yeah. you know, you, there will be a reward at the end if you do it right. But if you're wasting your time, you know, sometimes it can be very difficult to get back in that yeah. team. You can put on weight. You can lose the momentum in your own mind so yep. but ultimately you end up leaving United so that was a sad day as you said yep. can you remember that can you remember speaking to the manager where did you go oh, I went to Bolton um, I remember speaking to the manager and walking out this office thinking it's like the end of your your life Mike it's like when the boss is like you know you're not going to be part of the team for next season it's like I knew I was out with a long injury because it was a it was a knee injury that kept me out because I remember picking up my I had a, a screw in my knee, right? And I probably never should remove that screw because that's that's the the knee injury I picked up against Liverpool, and the screw was kind of bothering me after a year. And I said, mm. to "Boss, look, I need to remove the screw." And as soon as I removed that screw, I was supposed to play for South Africa in a World Cup qualification game against Ghana, and my knee wasn't right, so that was, that was uh, a but, uh, bad moment because it was fast to qualify for the World Cup and I couldn't play and that wasn't a good moment and from putting all the pressure on my right hand side mm. the other knee went I'm like <laughs> you got to be kidding me but um, I got a call from Stuart Pearce okay. and he was a city at this time so I'm thinking obviously I'm honoured Mike any manager calls you that wants you but he's at city and I can't go from United to City. It's like, it's not even your imagination. <laughs> you do not go from United to Manchester City. Well, I don't care what happens. Not many players have done it. Yeah. And you didn't want to do it? No chance. There is no way. And I was grateful to Stuart Pearce. And um, I didn't give him an answer, but I just like listened to him. And okay, yeah, but my mind was like, no, <laughs> you don't leave United and go to City, whatever happens. And uh, 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 Sam Allardyce. Um, sent um, a physio who's at, at City now, Carlo. Okay, yeah, I know. Carlo. And uh, and I think that kind of made my decision because they showed so much interest in me, Mike. And mm. and, th and I'm, uh, you find me in a state now. I'm, my head is like all over the show, and I'm just uh, left United. What am I going to do now? And I've stuck with this knee injury. He sends Carlo to the house. Carlo comes and train me for two months. Wow. Treat me. My body fat was probably like 16 or whatever, 17. So you enjoyed it? My, my, my head was just gone. I'm gone now. I'm like, I've left United. <laughs> like, life is like, what, where do I go? It's difficult. It's, it's difficult. It's an interesting moment. But you have to get yourself. But you need help sometimes. I need, yeah, exactly. And again, there's probably players who fall out of being at a club and they, they just spiral into the yeah. end of the career. But luckily yeah. for you, Sam Aldai sent Carlo down. He, he started training yeah. you again and he'd give you a second win. Oh, Carlo came and treated me, Mike, at, at, the, at, at the house. And uh, it was a, obviously Carlo was a tr physical trainer at the same time and uh, a physio. So it was brilliant. He treated me, my, my knees and everything, and went to the gym in the morning. So for one month, I, I do not recommend this, I only ate protein, so fish and, and, and eggs, whatever, that's it. And uh, uh, um, trained on the, in the morning because I couldn't run. Yeah, My knees yeah. were in pain and uh, on the bike, on the uh, cross, cross trainer, yeah. burning 3,000 calories a day. Boom, boom, getting down. After one month, Mike, probably the best shape I've been, ripped 9, 8%, cut down, knees are good, uh, done all the training. And I had problems with my Achilles, and uh, that was a nightmare injury. They got my Achilles right, so. Yeah. Um, but the problem I had, when I was United, I played with orthotics at that height. So when I went to Bolton, I, so the body couldn't deal with that. So okay. great training, great preparation. Started to play a couple of games, feeling great. Played my first game against Tottenham, feeling physically unbelievable. We went to training in, in Badragats. Uh, cryotherapy was introduced. I've never seen cryotherapy in my life. Mm. Um, training twice a day, nutrition, that all that at Bolton. And that's so as we know, and I, Sam Allardyce has come to Sunderland when I was there, and he's he was an innovator. Oh, I think he, he tried to bring in the latest of sports science. He brought in the cryotherapy chambers. He he was always thinking, what is the next point to yeah. help the player to be the best they can be? Sam Allardyce was uh, when I went that experience, that six months experience. 
it, it kind of uh, made me understand why he was such a great manager yeah. because he used whatever he had uh, the group of players and he said probably in his mind or I'm thinking he's saying I'm gonna get you the fittest that I'm gonna get you that I can that I can get you by bringing the physios the nutrition um, the sports science uh, technologies yeah. technology Mike I remember going to the change room and it was about four or five TVs so we had a we you could if we wanted to tell you out of position you tell now nah, boss hold on play quickly and then it would show you from behind the pitch mm. of and that's why I probably had someone looking so Quinny half time just moved to your right and it was unbelievable he was ahead and I was at United the bosses tells you make sure you do your job yeah so that was the difference at United where we were training every day at such a high level and things were happening so quick so when you come to the game on a Saturday you, you didn't face the players you faced in training. We always used to say that, didn't we? It was like, training was harder than the match. Than the match, match day was actually it was easier. The, it was the enjoy part. Yeah. So at Bolton was uh, the other way around. The right? other way around is was like, yes, training was hard in terms of pre-season, but it was more uh, uh, the information that the Samurai Dice gave you. You were fitter than most teams because that's made sure you were the fittest. Yeah. And as uh, the, the the style of football was, people would say whatever they want. The style of football was Kevin Davis. As quick as you can get the ball forward, second ball, cross, boom, go. I remember my first training session at Bolton, <laughs> I played left back and I passed the ball into the side of the pitch to Ivan Campo because he was on his own. Yeah. It's like, no, what are you doing? It's like, <laughs> he's free? No, Kevin Davis. We had a Nelka, Ella Juf, and I'm like, okay, that's made my job easier. Of course. Kevin Davis, ping it to him. And sometimes having an identity of the team and you know what your job is makes it easier. Mike, it was simple. You, uh. If you complicated it, it sound like you wouldn't play. But he said, you you get the ball left, black. Kevin Davis, second ball, fight for every ball, organize, and uh, it was great. The first game I remember he said to us against Tottenham, so Tottenham had Robbie Keane, uh, uh, um, Berbatov, uh, um, what's his name now, play for Burnley, Quick winger, um, but they had good all these good players. Yeah. Uh, the fo I think the foe, I'm not sure if the foe was a but it was West Ham that town. And all he said to us, they're not, they're not uh, as fit as you guys. That's all I'm thinking. Of. Where's the tactics? They're not ready. All we did, Mike, ran. You just ran him into the ground. Ran him into the ground. Ball forward, overlaps, crosses, w w get close to your man. Basic. Mm. Won the game. 2-0 or 3-0 or whatever and we were like okay and he sets targets he said the first 10 games I want I don't know yeah. 16 points she does, yeah. uh, second 10 games we were like this is great I think we, we've both worked big Sam and I'm sure he's, he's out there ready for his next job and um, you know, we wish him all the luck with that oh it was brilliant but ultimately you, you left Bolton how long was you at Bolton for? Oh, six months I unfortunately I fell out with uh, the physio there because of the my same physio? Uh, Carlos? No, 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 no. no. Carlos was brilliant. It was the head physio. Oh, okay. Let's not go into that. <laughs> well, we all, we all have our ups and downs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. moments. So it's fine. So from Bolton, then, what happened after that? Did, is, wh wh when did you retire? You, you, you ended up going a little bit. Yeah. You played a little bit in uh, Belgium. Belgium you went to Italy, maybe? I was in Italy first. Uh, nightmare experience. I was there for six months at a, a, a club called Brescia played one game I think and I fell out with the manager I was just in a bad place in my, in my life Mike yeah. I was like a low point and uh, um, just lost because I think when, when I left United it was just so I was confused found difficult after United oh, I was confused I was like which many players do you do I was really Mike I was just confused like what is going on here what, yeah. the, the, the football the, the, the way the environment and it was just it was a lost world for me and uh eventually left uh, Brescia after six months went to uh, um, Belgium a club called To Beast don't know how I ended up going there through agents and all this crazy world that people live in and uh, the best part of Belgium was meeting the best part half of my life and 
amazing six months experience. Um, so you basically met your your yeah, wife here. Yeah, yeah. Another high five. <laughs> <then. laughs> Congratulations. Uh, yeah. So then ultimately you end up retiring. Did you yeah. know the day? You know, sometimes you don't know when it's going to be your last game. Yeah. You, you sometimes see these occasions when people have no. a very bad last game. You almost think, wow, it's such a shame because if they yeah. would have gone out with all the, you know, the, the plaudits and yeah. you know, everybody waving the flags. It's almost like no. a, a transition to your next life. But you wish that you could have that moment mm. when you see other players have that moment you think wow that's yeah. amazing and when I saw Pelé playing his last game in the Maracanã for Brazil and people shouting Fica which means uh, stay and you imagine that moment you think wow that would be great for all of us yeah. but we don't have other players have that moment my last club I played for Mike was Doncaster Doncaster, okay. Doncaster Rovers and I came here for in the championship for six months and uh, uh, Sean will just call a very good manager like to play football and <laughs> shoot it be perfectly and uh, it's strange because when I was a kid at, at um, in South Africa, I was the captain of the of my Western Province team. Yeah. And the last game I played for Doncaster, I was the captain, which was strange. We played against uh, QPR, and we won that game. And he gave me the captain band. It was like last time I was captain when I was ten years old. And but then didn't think that would be my last game, and uh, it, they didn't renew my contract. And I was like, all the players, I think they wanted me to stay. Of course, I wanted to play on and. But it was a strange environment because as soon as Doncaster at that time knew they are safe in the league, mm. the players kind of like just said, Chew which was it. like, <laughs> it's confused. Like guys, it's still a season to go. We have a chance of going up the, uh, you yeah. know, promotion. Nope, just left it, and that was confusing for me. And uh, um, so I just so I, I, oh. nothing happened after that in terms of other uh, opportunities, opportunities, offers, and. So how did you find that transition then? So because again, it's very difficult for yeah. certain people to transition out of being in an environment of sport, in that environment of, of in that sort of <coughs> dressing room um, yeah. um, spark. And for myself, I could sort of feel that it was coming. I ended up obviously, you know, moving into um, something I was already quite passionate about with strength mm -hmm. and conditioning and studying there. So how did you transition now to to where you are now? Or, or even now, you're probably still trying to learn what you want to be. Yep. You know, this is quite a traumatic period. How long ago did you retire now? It was uh, 33. So 33 years it was old. nine years ago. Yep. So how have you sort of navigated that path from where you are to now? <sighs> Mike, it was, uh, I remember going back to my apartment uh, I don't cast and just sitting in my apartment. I remember the assistant coach Richie came to see him at the house and he just like started to speak to me and I was like I just remember li looking at him, listening to him, but I was thinking, what do I do now? Because mm -hmm. since the age of four, this is all I've been doing. Waking up every morning and going to train and play football. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, what do I tell Katie? She's with me now and she's uh, came with me from Belgium. You got the responsibilities. To I look have responsibility, after it. like, huh? and it was again. Mike is like <laughs> <laughs> the entire world <laughs> implodes. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! So what did you do? We ended up going back to Belgium. Oh, you went to Belgium. We went to Belgium. Uh, we stayed there for a while, and uh, I got a contact. I got the call from the club. I think it was speaking to Dennis. I got a call from the club to uh, do some com like uh, one of the brands I think it was it was Aeon and it was, a, it was about to sign a deal and they asked me to come and be there for the signing of not the signing of the deal like the, the, uh, the first uh, opening of it, the launch sorry the launch yeah. and there's a picture on my Instagram and you see uh, my dress code everyone's dressed tie I can see by <laughs> Mike, I turned up with a pair of trainers, <laughs> jeans, some smart, whatever, smart jacket, and you got Robbo and you got uh, David Kill and <laughs> Sir Bobby all dressed up, and it's like, no, it's like those moments in life. What, what were you thinking? And the club, I have to say, the club has been beyond amazing. It's just like. So, Man United now are. Uh yeah, helping you to. Yeah, the continue. club's been amazing by getting him involved with the, doing the commercial work and uh, and that can I kind of MU TV MU TV and and and, and uh, uh, helping with my coaches coaching badge because I came back to the, to to Manchester and uh, started training with um, with Warren Joyce and helping out with the 21s and that kind of saved me, Mike, in, in a way mm. because that's all I wanted. That's all I wanted. Wake up in the morning. 
get in the car and go and play football. Um, but it's, I missed out a bit. I was at Blackburn. I was at Sunderland. Sunderland. Blackburn. Well, we were at Sunderland. Yeah, we well, we'll probably skipped little bits of yeah. trials and bits yeah. and pieces because how long was your Blackburn for? For a few months, and I was consigned with the Blackburn and Marcus ended up getting to Man, Man City. City. So that and you come yeah. up to Sunderland when I was there, when yeah. Roy was the manager. Yeah. You stayed at my apartment yeah. for three yeah. or four months, and <laughs> you went through that process. And you was in and out of injury again, yeah. weren't you? Yeah. You couldn't quite get established. Roy yeah. was absolutely adamant of what he wanted yeah. to achieve because we just got promoted to the yeah. Premier League. Yeah. And we was in again. We, we, we had um, Yorkie was there. Yeah. And and Nicole was there, yourself was coming, we, we had a good team, but ultimately, even Roy at that moment in time, yeah. what did he say to you? No, he said, um, we're not gonna, they're not going to take me, and you know, Keeney's straight, and, mm. but I have to say, Keeney, also when I uh, drove home that day, and and uh, just sent me a message, you know, thank you, and and that's that's what, that's, that's Keeney, yeah. that's what the side people um, don't know. I don't think he wants us to know. So we want people to know, but he's just absolutely brilliant. No, I think uh, for Roy, and this is what I always say publicly, is with the people he trusts and the people yeah. he knows, he's an incredible guy. You yeah. know, he, he's he's you know, considerate and he understands, and but he, he expects the most from you. I worked with yeah. him for all them years, and you know, he drove me to be the best I could be. Yeah. You know, and. Um, he, he's now going at Knott's Forest as we all know with uh, Martin O'Neill and I work with Martin O'Neill as well and we wish them all the very best there yeah. and um, it'll be great to catch up one day have a coffee and maybe talk about oh, I mean we was over in, in Ireland recently weren't we yeah, for, for Liam, game, Liam yeah. Noah's tribute yeah. game and you know Roy's the boy's different gravy but yeah. when you know him and he's such a funny guy and all these other yeah. sides but he has got that Blunt um, <laughs> harshness about him, but well, that is him. That's his character. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we was at the point where um, you you train at Man United with Warren George. You're getting that feeling that you want to be a part of yeah. football again. So you decide to take your um, your coaching, coaching license. Yeah. Oh, that was the because uh, that's the closest. I just wanted to be involved. I just like now. I just want to be involved in football, Mike. And because when when you leave, uh, stop playing the game. That's all we knew, and, and I was trying to do other things. Just to, I do the media things, every TV, do La Liga, and all that is great. And but I missed that every day. And I had an opportunity uh, when Ollie was the manager at um, at Cardiff. He asked me to come and work with under twenty ones, and this is the first time I got into an environment where I'm actually coaching yeah. and the young players, and you can see the progress. and And it was hard to leave Cardiff because after eight nine months, you know, Ollie moved on, and, and I, I mean, stayed. This is quite uh, obviously Ollie. Ollie on the Sox is the manager yeah. of, of Man United now, and he's doing an absolutely brilliant job. But when Ollie was at Cardiff, and he's going through his own um, sort of learning curve, because yeah. prior to that he did really well. Yeah. And Cardiff was a Premiership team at that moment. Yeah, in time. Premiership team. I remember speaking to him in the tunnel myself, and he was saying how good the young lads were, and he, he had this like overriding feeling of positivity. Yeah. But I, th well, I think he got relegated that year, and yeah. he ended up obviously losing his job, and he went back to. Um, and to Norway, yep. but you was down there with him, and you saw him every day. Work yep. with him, yep. and I suppose my question for you regarding Ollie now is: you know, does it surprise you that he's doing what he's doing, and how was it working with him back then? It was uh, obviously at Dempsey with him, so it was great because Ollie, like I said, he was so positive and wanted to uh, implement the ex experience he had in United. But at some at times, the the group of people or players you work with, if they don't have that same mentality Mike mm. it's very hard mm. um, so Ollie coming now with 10 years of experience and at the same time the the chairman uh, at Cardiff he had his own ideas and um, when when he's got his own ideas it's very difficult to kind of even with the players I think the players let him down for Ollie because you know I know Ollie what he's like a very positive guy and a great guy to get on with and probably a great manager to play for um, so I think the, the players at that time, and I, I saw it from the outside and the environment and I knew this is not the right environment for Ole because coming from Manchester United, the environment he created now at United and you can see the results and you're dealing with better players. But at the same time, it's not just about the better players, it's the attitudes of players, Mike, and you know yourself, you don't have to, if you don't have the best of players in the world, okay, that's fine. But the work ethic and the attitude and the mentality, if that's not right, you have no chance. And I didn't see that at the Cardiff at that time. Maybe a few had it, but the majority of the group was just uh, were, were negative and it was difficult for Ollie, but we learned so much in that period while I was there. And uh, it was hard for me because the group of players I spent with and the 21s, you, you, you form a connection. Mm. And when you have to leave those players, it's hard because you're thinking, I'm leaving these kids in this environment. Mm. 
and uh, that was tough for me. That was probably one of the most difficult moments as my early career as, as a coach. And that's why I wanted to continue because I just feel like I enjoy the the interaction, helping and, helping. and the interaction and, and, and seeing players improve. And mm. that's what I love doing. So we ended up doing our, our B license together, yep. and now you're going to do your A license, mm -hmm. and then now you're about to um, start your, your your pro license very soon. So. Yeah, so once you get all your qualifications, Quinton, you, you, I'm sure you're ready to get back into the world of coaching. Mm -hmm. Who knows where that might take you? Yep. You could end up being a coach in all the different places. You've obviously um, had uh, some type of interaction, whether it could be Italy, Spain, South mm -hmm. Africa. But we wish you all the very best with that. And who knows where you might turn up? Is there anywhere where you would like to be? Or is it a case of you just wait and see what comes along? Uh, Mike, uh, I've always wanted to... Uh not always wanted to. I loved Italian football early 90s, and my, one of my teams I liked at that time was uh, Milan because they had the amazing Van Basten Hullet. So I would like to manage in Italy one day, uh, Spain, and uh, of course the Premier League. But uh, I need to, obviously, there's a lot of work to do. I need to become a good coach, a good manager. I need to be more assertive because, you know, I'm sometimes a bit too nice of a person. But that's, that's my nature. But I love just uh, helping players become better and um, giving him all the information that I went through, all the experience I went through as a player and just trying to give him that uh, and, and help them become better people, get better players and just uh, trying to create a good environment. Like we had at United, it was a great environment, competitive, we're learning every day and uh, getting a group of players that depend on each other and, and forget about yourself as a player and you're just focusing on helping the team. That's that's my goal as a, as a manager one day to, to create that. Brilliant. And suppose if you do what you did with all the other things, just go into the garden, look into the stars yep. and imagine it happening. I'm <laughs> sure that could be a possibility. <laughs> okay, well, Quinton, that's been absolutely brilliant. brilliant. Um, and we're going to finish off now with just five quick questions. Okay. Just to finish it off, in, it can be one sentence or two, um, just to get your final thoughts. So the yeah. first one, um, very quickly, your best footballing moment? Uh, wow, Mike, scoring in the World Cup for South Africa, making my debut for United and winning the Premier League. I didn't say three, I said one, but Sorry. there's three good ones, <laughs> that's fine. Next question, what is your worst regret? Not in football, just in life in general. Mm. I'm not pre-prepared for these, by What's the way. What's my worst regret, regret. is... Um, wow, no, I don't know, I need to think about that one, Mike. Almost like a sliding door moment where you thought, I should have done that, but instead, maybe it might have been going to Manchester City with Stuart Pierce. I don't know. Yeah. No. That's not his <laughs> way. You don't go to City. Next one then. What would you tell your past self from where you are now? Great question. I think I thought about this. What would I say? No, that kind of runs, age, that runs through, my, through my mind a lot, Mike. Do yeah. not have any fear. And I had this information. For years in my in my mind, I just needed to use it mm. to not have any fear. Excellent. So, what is your dream for the future? Uh, my dream for the future is to complete my coaching badges and become a manager. But my dream for the future, Denzel Washington said it best to become. He said he's in the service business, mm. which means to help people. Excellent. Um, and what is your advice to any young aspiring football player? So many, Mike. Um, just, just one major piece of advice. If, if one if a young player was here and I was like, Quinton, I've got 10 seconds. Don't have any fear. Believe in yourself. Work hard. And use your imagination. Let your imagination run. <coughs> it should be limitless imagina imagination because that's what happened to me. Brilliant. Then the very last question. I think running as a golden thread through this entire interview has been that thought of you know, if you have the right thought process the imagination if you have the the right p's and q's the right soul the right grounding mm -hmm. but ultimately i think with you um, more than most is your conviction and your belief in god mm -hmm. um you're obviously a regular church goer yep um, you, you give an offering yeah and um, it's something what sits very very deep within your um your way of being so mm -hmm. um how has it been um, within the church um, help you and, and is that something um, you're really proud of? Well that's something I grew up in and sometimes it's, it's, it's difficult when you grow up in that environment Mike you think there's no other difference but from leaving home and being on my own going through all the experience I've been through and holding 
tight that faith that kind of made me even more closer to to God if you want to say that mm. and uh, my dad f two words when I left go to church and give your offering and I've carried that through my whole life and, and uh, I know myself everything I've experienced in my life or everything I've achieved or anything good I've done in my life is because of God and I know in future that will be the same because I could not have survived all the stuff I've been through be able to sit here have this conversation with you if it wasn't by God's grace so if there's anything I could give anyone from all the conversations we've had this whole time put God first everything else after that is a bonus brilliant well Quinton I want to say thank you very much for coming on <laughs> my first <laughs> live um, interview on the podcast um, just for the subscribers brilliant. the shirt behind here which is my Clegg number 23 we are both going to sign and one of our subscribers will actually uh, win that shirt so I'm going to talk you through that in the next segment but for me and from Quinton from the Mike Clegg thank you YouTube much. channel see you soon